And I'm recording the lecture from right here, pretty much at the heart of the storm. Um, so the reason that I am uh, recording the lecture for today is because, um, you know, we have quite a lot of uh, information to cover in the class next week. Um, we're going to be postponing student presentations from today, bumping them to next week. And so therefore, I'm going to be giving an abbreviated presentation um, of the papers. And just in order to make sure that um, we cover everything and that I explain um, these principal concepts and uh, terminology uh, in adequate form, uh, it's important for me to kind of cover what we would have covered, or at least some of what we would have covered um, in the class that we missed. So next Tuesday, we're going to be starting class with a quiz, which is going to cover the readings from to, um, today and next week. Um, that'll be about 10 minutes. These are straightforward, um, pretty simple questions just to ascertain people did the readings. Um, I'll give a brief overview, shorter than probably my normally would do, just covering the important points for those assigned papers. Um, and then we'll have our student presentations. Um, initially, we'll have the two that we're going to be this week, Nora and Ileana. Um, I'm asking students to please observe the 20 minute limit. Please use only 15 slides max, um, because if you go beyond that, uh, we're not going to make it in time. So, um, so Nora and Ileana will present some papers that they found that go along with the topics of um, the papers assigned for January 27th. We'll take a break and then we'll come back and Megan, Garrett, and Oliver will give presentations on papers that they've selected to go along with the February 3rd readings, um, which get more into the genetics of early um, nervous system development. So um, initially I wanted to address kind of a question. It's, um, it was a paradox or a puzzle to me when I first started studying this topic, which is that if we're starting out with a fertilized egg, which has um, half its uh, DNA from the mother, half from the father, forming a new novel um, uh, combination of genes in the form of the zygote, um, which will become the new baby, how is it that as the cells divide, carrying this basically essentially 100% identical genetic information, that the cells learn or, or have cues or information to become different things? Because as we see the um, zygote subdividing and progressing, um, we don't just continue to have a ball of cells that are identical. The cells begin to change, and some cells become one thing while some become another. Where does that information come from? if they're all initially identical. And what I'm showing you here is the idea that the zygote continues to subdivide, and as it does so, um, the conformation will change. You don't just get a solid cluster of balls um, for whatever physical reasons and um, having to do with the membranes and the way that the cells adhere to one another. They actually begin to form a ball, which is hollow and fluid-filled. Um, and so as some of the differentiation that occurs has just to do with these physical processes, which will produce cells that are, for example, on the inner versus outer layers, etc. But another mechanism that leads to um, differentiation of um, individual cells is the cytoplasmic information. So probably some of you have heard that um, there's a special kind of genetic information that we inherit from the mother only, and this is carried in our mitochondrial genetics, and that is because um, the cytoplasm for our very first cell comes exclusively from the egg, and the mitochondria, which have their own genetics, they're separate from the DNA of the nucleus, um, will come from the maternal line only. Um, and that's why it's uh, possible to do genetic tracing on the female lineage only, is because of this transfer of mitochondrial um, genes in the cytoplasm of the egg. So the sperm really has no cytoplasm in it. It's just a little packet of pure genetic information. Um, the cytoplasm for our very first cell comes from the mother. But there are other things in the cytoplasm as well, including um, these determinants, which include proteins, regulatory RNAs, and messenger RNAs. Those um, cues in the cytoplasm are not distributed equally as the cells divide. So they're distributed somewhat unequally, and so the different distribution of these cues begins to give one potential difference between cells that can cue them into an asymmetrical or differentiated um, ongoing process. Um, and then an, another factor is, as I mentioned a minute ago, that as the um, 
<clears throat> as that embryonic cluster um, begins to increase in size, conformational changes will begin to produce um, unique zones, for example, inside and outside, or as the um, hollow ball of cells begins to invert, we get cells that are on the edge that are um, um, and cells that are in the middle. And these kinds of cues can begin to stimulate the transcription of different um, morphogens, which will then produce developmental zones that are differentiating in a specific direction. And so these are how cues come about that begin to tell different parts of the embryo to become different things, even though all the cells began with the same nuclear um, genetic information. Um, okay. Here I'm showing um, a movie which basically goes through, it's, a, it's not a real um, recording, it's, it's a um, stylized cartoon of what might happen. We're looking at a zygote inside a woman's body, and inside the fallopian tube, and then the uterus. So we start with the zygote, which is moving down the fallopian tube, and it's dividing or cleaving. So it's forming new cells, a bundle of new cells which is the early growth phase, continuing to move down the fallopian tube, becoming a larger cluster, and then becoming a ball, which is called a blastocyst. Um, in real life, this takes about five days. <clears throat> Here we're going to look inside the ball or the blastocyst, which is, which is partially hollow, and inside we see a cluster of cells which is called the inner cell mass, or the ICM, and the ICM is what actually becomes the embryo itself. The outer ball of cells um, in, in vertebrates becomes the amniotic sac and the placenta. Here we see the embryo implanting in the uterine wall. This is where pregnancy is initiated. Again, we're looking inside at the blue inner cell mass, which here is beginning to form a disc. The cells are continuing to grow, changing their physical positions or migrating and creating patterns. This is just a close-up on the disc, <clears throat> which is now forming the embryo. And here you see the neural groove forming through migration and uh, movement of cells. And that's going to enfold on itself. This is a cross-section showing layers of cells or germ layers, which will become different things, ectoderm, skin and nervous system, mesoderm, bone and muscle, endoderm, internal organs. And that neural groove will begin to enfold on itself and merge the edges will merge and it will become the neural tube, which is inside the embryo, shown here from the side. You can see limb buds forming, you begin to see the head, the eye, and eventually a small embryo. Which is, which is um, this layer right here, specifically the green layer. So we're looking at a, cr a close-up of that green layer. It's a different color here, but it's the same, it's the same layer. This layer right here, it's shown in blue. And so as that groove begins to form and deepen, <clears throat> and the, the edges from either side begin to move inward, this side moves in, this side moves in, and they converge, they sort of um, um, pinch off, and they become the neural tube, which you see here, which ultimately becomes the central nervous system. You can also see some additional cells that are lying above the neural tube, little packets of cells or clusters, called the neural crest. This part of the ectoderm becomes the peripheral nervous system. And then you'll see here the outer edges of the ectoderm itself as it pinches, um, as it pinches and closes off, leave the rest of the ectoderm on the outside, which becomes ultimately the skin, the epidermis, the outside of our body. <clears throat> So what's the difference between the central and the peripheral nervous system? I think I talked about that a little bit in the lecture that I gave um, at the um, uh, J-term. But here you can see that the central nervous system is specifically the brain and the spinal cord itself only. Okay, And the peripheral nervous system is all the rest of the nervous system with the nerves, including cranial nerves and spinal nerves, that both um, exit and enter the spinal cord and the brain itself. Okay, and here what I'm showing you is um, the no what the um, long-term derivative of the notochord, which is actually the vertebrae or the bones that surround the spine and some of the um, the layers that. Uh, and membranes that surround and pr protect the nervous system. And the notochord itself becomes that entire package, not just the vertebrae, but also the skull, which surrounds the brain. 
So here we're looking at basically the neural tube from the side. And as I mentioned before, the neural tube is sort of a hierarchical structure with the bottom of the neural tube, or the tail end, becoming the spinal cord. And then different layers or stacking, stacking um, layers of the, of the neural tube becoming subsequently higher um, or more elaborated and complex parts of the central nervous system or brain. So here we see that the part of the neural tube that's adjacent to the spinal cord becomes the hindbrain, which is the lower parts of the brain or the more um, basic subconscious parts of the brain that control things like a breathing, coughing, and other reflexes, things that we don't have conscious control over. Um, midbrain will become some of the basal ganglia structures, um, some of the structures that are involved in things like sleep, um, and some basic movement control, things that aren't really particularly conscious, but a little bit higher than hindbrain. And then the forebrain is what ultimately becomes the cerebral cortex and also some other forebrain stru structures, including the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, and I'm giving you this diagram because I think it's a little bit better and it's in color, which corresponds to this diagram, which comes out of the uh, Nowakowski and Hayes textbook. Again, I wanted to um, emphasize the fact that the um, cross-sectional planes and the, the images or the views that we're going to have on the developing embryo shift a little bit because when we start out with the neural tube, it's one flat structure in one plane. And if we look at a cross-section of it, we're looking at a cross-section just in one plane. But as the um, <clears throat> neural tube continues to develop, it hinges over at this point and so um, this will slightly change the orientation um, for different cross sections. And here I'm just showing you that this part of the neural tube is ultimately going to become this part of the brain. And this region right here is the hypothalamus and the um, thalamus. And you can see that what, what would be the tip of the um, neural tube is actually the very frontal most part of our frontal lobe. And here I'm showing you different planes of section in the central nervous system. Um, so if we're looking in the spine, we're looking at a transverse cross section. And this is initially what we're using to look at the neural tube. So everything is taken in one cross sectional plane. But as the um, neural tube develops and hinges, we now are going to take the transverse plane into this orientation because of that hinge. And so this cross section of the brain is going to correspond to this cor um, cross section of the neural tube. Okay, and so this is um, the transverse um, plane is also what we would call a coronal cross section. Um, and this plane is going to give us the sagittal cross section. And then the plane, the horizontal plane, in the plane of the floor is going to give us this kind of a cross section of the brain, which is from front to back. And it's a little bit different in orientation from the same um, orientation cross-section of the spinal cord. Um, re referenced in the Nowakowski paper as the source or the birthplace of many of the neurons. And then this is the outer edge, the peel layer of the cerebral cortex, outside of which we see the skull. And here's just another view um, of that same concept. It's a slightly less differentiated version of the developing brain. But again, we're looking here in the coronal plane. Um, this is the chorionic plexus, which is a major blood supply for the developing brain. Here we're seeing the um, ventricles, which are fluid filled, the top of the brain, and the bottom of the brain. Okay. And so this um, cross-section would correspond to a cross-section of the developing um, cortex, which you see here, and would correspond to this part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, which is going to be right here. And similarly, what I'm looking at here is a cross-section of the neural tube, um, somewhat earlier, and this image came from the um, Rowich and Krigstein paper, which is assigned uh, for next week. Um, and again, you can see the roof plate, or the alar portion of the neural tube, and then the floor plate, or the basal portion. So this diagram comes from the Nowakowski and Hayes, and you can see the roof plate and the floor plate, which eventually become here a cross-section of the spinal cord, where the roof plate is actually our back, and the floor plate is the front. Okay, So floor plate, which is basilar in the terms of the spinal cord, floor plate is front, roof plate is back.
with regards to the brain, the roof plate is the top and the floor plate is the bottom. And this diagram also from the Nowakowski paper is showing you a cross section slightly higher up. Um, and so here we're now beginning to look at the base of the brain. Um, and we're seeing again what will become the ventricles, the top of the brain, which will become the cerebral cortex if, depending on how far forward we are, and the floor plate, which is the base of the brain. So again, cross section of the neural tube in the horizontal plane, and then cross section after the hinge, which is going to be in the coronal plane, but looking at the same essential orientation, roof, base, roof, and base. And in the Krigstein paper, what you're seeing is that the, the distinction for the developmental diversity of the cells, depending on where they're located along this gradient from floor to roof, is going to be determined by this distribution of signaling factors, which are transcribed based on where in the neural tube you are. And those signaling cues and the particular gradient at a particular location is going to determine whether cells become different kinds of neurons or ultimately different kinds of glia. All of these dis um, differentiation choices are going to be determined by signaling factors, proteins that have been transcribed from genetic um, cues. And again, um, I mentioned this in your handout, um, and again was mentioned in the Nowakowski paper, and it might have been mentioned in a couple of the others as well. Initially, the neural tube is um, developed in a segmental fashion, so corresponding to the hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain. Um, but ultimately, the brain itself becomes super segmental because the different regions of um, those layers actually elaborate into structures that connect all over the brain, not just to one zone of the body. The spinal cord, however, stays in a segmental, um, which is a very primitive or basic kind of an organization, where each segment of the spinal cord corresponds to a specific segment of the body. Okay, so I'm switching gears here now, and we're looking at a cross-section of the developing neural tube, with this being the ventricular zone, and this being the outer layer. So you can see here the neural tube inside the embryo, and we're looking at this little cross-section right here, so we're on the roof plate. We're looking at the roof plate cross-section of the embryo, so this is the top, the dura and the um, skull and the skin, and this down here is the ventricles, ventricular zone, or the subventricular zone, which ultimately is going to border on the ventricles, which are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so what's happening in this layer is this process of proliferation where mother cells are subdividing, they're producing daughter cells, and those daughter cells are sent off to migrate and move their way outward into um, in the cerebral cortex and or other parts of the brain. Okay, and so this is an active migration process. So this is the process of proliferation, the subdivision of these progenitor cells, and then the release of the daughter cells to continue and migrate away while the mother cells stay in this um, subventricular zone and continue to proliferate. Um, and this diagram comes from a um, paper that was assigned, the Tagahachi ta 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 paper for, um, for next week. And what you're seeing here is that there are a couple of factors that modulate the process of proliferation. One factor is how many of the um, cells that are produced, the daughter cells, are kept in the proliferating layer versus released to migrate. Okay, and if you can think of this in financial terms, it's sort of like you have a retirement fund that you want to live off of, and you can only take out a certain amount of money each year. If you take too much money in a given year, you're going to you're gonna wear down your principal, and you won't have enough money left. Okay, so the, the same principle applies here. We want to release a certain number of daughter cells to migrate, but not so many that we deplete the progenitor um, pool. So the Q fraction is the proportion of neurons that are released to migrate versus those that come back to become or to continue as progenitors. So that's one factor in terms of how many actual neurons are produced, the Q fraction. Um, and actually we end up with more neurons with if more daughter cells come back to the progenitor pool because we have an exponential increase then in later phases of the number of daughter cells that can be released into the Q fraction. If we release 
too many um, daughter cells initially into the first Q fraction, then our progenitor pool is depleted. Or in retirement, if we spend all of our money right away, then we're not going to have enough principal to generate money for future years. If we only take a little bit early on, we've got a huge pool to use in later years. So this is the same principle for the um, proliferation of neurons, that, we, that depending on how many cells are released versus kept will determine ultimately how many neurons there are in total. The other factor that's determining is how many cycles of division um, the progenitors undergo. And these number of cycles basically increase as you go up the phylogenetic scale. So in hum human neuronal proliferation, we see the highest number of um, cycles of neurogenesis. Something goes wrong with one of those processes, either not enough cycles of division um, or the Q fraction is incorrect, then we end up with too few neurons ultimately because of the decreased number of progenitors. And um, in the adult developed brain, this is going to lead to um, the condition of microcephaly. The brain is too small. There weren't enough neurons produced. So the next step in the process is the migration and what you're seeing here is a photomicrograph of radial glia which are sp special cells that form the scaffolding along which the neurons move as they're migrating well, to the proliferation process in moving the progenitors up and down but they're also critical to the migration process because the neurons are using basically these extensions as they migrate along the radial glia and those extensions are comprised of these filaments and microtubules and if there's a genetic um, uh, mutation which causes a problem with some of the proteins that encode these microtubules or filaments then the neuron may not be able to move its way along the radial glia properly and that can produce um, an anomaly of neuronal migration um, and I actually picked a more updated um, paper by Chris Walsh which is the Manzini and Walsh paper I think of 2010 and so he talks a little bit about some of these mutations that can affect the microfilament systems and can lead to um, migrational abnormalities so in the um, Nowakowski and Hayes paper we saw a diagram here which is showing us the inverted um, or inside out laminar pattern that's produced by active radial migration so here we have neurons that are being born and they're actively migrating out the radial glia and the pattern that they form is an inside out pattern because the earliest um, generated cells actually stop at the inside or innermost layer and then the later generated cells migrate past them and so the cells are, that are on the outermost layer of cerebral cortex are closest to the skin and the skull um, in, in layer 2 of cerebral cortex, layer 1 has no neurons in it um, are actually the youngest neurons they're the ones that were produced last this is the opposite of what happens in passive displacement in humans about 10 percent of neurons move to their final location um, locations through passive displacement primarily in the spinal cord and a few of the other midline structures where the cells don't really have very far to go and so what happens here is that cells are um, daughter cells are produced and they're simply pushed outward by the production of new daughter cells and so therefore the oldest cells are going to be on the outside they've been passively moved outward and are displaced so in active radial migration we have an inside out or inverted laminar pattern and in passive displacement um, the, the um, oldest cells are on the outside. Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated diagram, but what we're looking at here, this axis is basically time. Okay, and we're looking at a cross section of the um, cerebral cortex from the top or the peel layer, the, the outermost layer near the skull, versus the bottom, which is going to be the ventricular zone. So this is the ventricular cerebrospinal fluid down here. This is the outside outermost layer. This is the beginning, and this is full-blown maturity. So this is a cross section of cortex in full maturity and a cross section early on. So when we first begin, we basically just have two layers, a ventricular zone um, and then the zone above it, which doesn't have much in it yet. Okay, And the um, ventricular zone has the neural progenitor progenitors, which are going to be subdividing and throwing off daughter cells. All right, so these daughter cells begin to migrate out the radial glia. They form something called a preplate, which then subdivides into the subplate and the cortical plate. Um, 
And so basically these neurons migrate outward. They form the inside out pattern that I spoke of. So the early formed cells are gonna be down deep. The later formed cells are gonna be more on the outside. The outermost cortical layer is called layer one, and layer one actually has no neurons in it. It's a, a neuron-free zone, but layers two and three are the, um, the youngest neurons. Layers four, a little bit older, five, and layer six is basically the firstborn neurons. And what you're seeing here are pyramidal cortical cells, um, and this one's probably an interneuron because it's not a pyramidal shape. So after all the neurons have migrated, then the radial glia um, is essentially completed its work, and now the radial glia can actually become glia. So neurogenesis occurs first, very early on, and then after neurogenesis is complete and migration is complete, we have gliogenesis. So we have oligocyte um, precursors, which are baby um, glia, um, or baby oligocytes, and we also have precursors that become astrocytes. So astrocytes are the um, form of glia that provide um, metabolic support. You can see the astrocyte here is right next to a blood vessel, um, and they're, and they're um, exchanging waste and oxygen to, to sort of take care of the neurons, and they're distributed throughout cortex. We also have um, the oligodendrocytes, which are the um, form of glia that actually provide insulation to um, myelinated um, axons. And we don't really find oligodendrocytes for the most part in gray matter. That's why it's called gray matter, because there's not really any myelin. But in the, the layer below the cerebral cortex, where all of the um, axons are either exiting cerebral cortex to go down to um, muscles, um, or to, to, um, to, to send signals to other structures in the brain, and where all the sensory information is coming into the cerebral cortex, this entire zone is going to be myelinated, and it's called the internal capsule. Um, and so it's this white zone that underlies the outermost gray zone of the cerebral cortex, all this myelinated in and out um, axonal um, connectivity to the cortex itself. And here we're just looking at a close-up of the gliogenesis phase. Um, you can see one of the radial glia ultimately turning into an astrocyte um, and becoming a layer of white matter, WM, white matter, that underlies the cerebral cortex itself. Okay? Um, and here we're just looking at the fact that oligodendrocytes, much like neurons, have to migrate. Um, they have to move outward to get to their ultimate um, locations. Um, OPC stands for uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cell, um, and there are different regions of the um, subependymal zone um, where oligodendrocytes uh, destined for different parts of the nervous system are going to be generated and then migrate outward. Um, here what we're seeing is something called tangential migration, which basically means coming in from the side, and that's pretty much what happens in cerebral cortex. Um, most of the oligodendrocytes actually come in through tangential migration, whereas in the um, rest of the brain and spinal cord, they're moving outward radially. And the difference between these two kinds of migration is that radial means you just start from the floor plate and move directly outward. So you go from the inside to the outside in a pretty straight line, or radial line. Tangential migration means that the cells are being born further down. Um, here, it's just a different acronym for oligodendrocyte precursors. Everybody's going to have their own term for things. I don't understand it. But these oligodendrocyte pre precursors, which are born a little bit further down in the subependymal zone, are migrating tangentially or sideways to ultimately get to their final locations. And the interneurons, um, the, the um, GABAergic neurons, as in comparison to the glutamatergic pyramidal cells that migrate radially, the interneurons are also migrating tangentially. Um, as do the oligodendrocytes. And all of these processes are critically important because the layers of the cerebral cortex ultimately have to be organized very precisely. We're seeing here a cross-section of the cortex, and you can see the layers going from the outside to the inside with the white matter below. And we have it, um, uh, input and output uh, white matter myelinated axons that's coming into and exiting the cerebral cortex. Um, and each one of these layers has a very specific role and there's a specific type of cell that's destined to be located in that layer. 
And what I'm showing you here is the functional distinctions within the cerebral cortex. And this pattern is true across mammals. So we see this pattern in rats, but we see the same thing in human beings. So layer six, um, which is the deepest layer, is a layer of pyramidal cells, which pretty much exclusively send projections descending back to the thalamus. Um, layer 5 pyramidal cells um, also have descending projections that go to um, other subcortical structures like the basal ganglia and the spinal cord. Um, uh, let's see. Layers um, 3 and layers 2 actually primarily project to other cortical layers. So the, a lot of the intracortical connectivity both within a zone and across zones, so for example across the corpus callosum or the kinds of fiber tracts that interconnect um, different co components of the language system, for example, are cells that are originating in layers 2 and 3 and projecting across, um, sort of out the side, to other parts of the cerebral cortex itself. Okay, um, and layer five, which is actually going to subcortical structures and spinal cord, is the one that includes all of the large pyramidal motor neurons. Right, so these um, descending projections are the ones that innervate our motor system, and so you can see that each layer has this very specific job or role, and that if neurons destined to play a specific role end up in the wrong place, then the circuitry of the brain is going to be profoundly impaired or affected. Um, also, I think in the Walsh paper, he talked a little bit about the types of malformations or neurologic syndromes that can occur when we have um, anomalies of migrations. We can have um, we can have focal uh, migrational abnormalities where clusters of cells go to the wrong place, um, but we can also have bands um, or whole uh, layers of neurons that migrate incorrectly, and here in the case of Pachygeria, um, we basically have um, lots of neurons that have migrated too far, and they've migrated all the way into the meninges where we're really not supposed to even see any neurons. We also see lysencephaly, which means an absence of the sulcal um, indentations that are typical of the human cerebral cortex, again because of this incorrect um, migration. So th the formation of sulci and gyri is a natural um, physical process that arises as neurons begin to migrate to their collect, um, correct places. Um, they begin to pack against each other, and there's not enough space for them in the, in the flat cerebral cortex, and so the cerebral cortex has to begin to fold. And the, and the properties of enfolding are remarkably identical from person to person, which allows us to have landmark sulci that are consistently formed in development, um, and we see them, there's slight variations, but sort of like a, a fingerprint but the actual, the major sulci that we use for orientation and landmarks are, are there um, in every no normal brain development. Um, when we have this abnormal development because of de um, defects in migration, we're not going to see those natural um, landmark structures that should be formed if development proceeds normally. So pachygeria and lysencephaly are two examples of neuropathologic syndromes that can occur from improper migration. So what we're looking at here is a cross-section of cerebral cortex in a human infant um, is stylized. I, I don't believe this is actual um, tissue. Um, and I say that because it looks like what they've done is stylized the exact same neurons and shown the proliferation that occurs from the newborn to the two years of age. And there would be no way to have that tissue from one individual. So these are just sort of cartoons that have been drawn. Um, and you can see the, the cells that are located in their different layers, but they have very limited um, uh, dendritic processes. So there's not a lot of dendritic branches. And you can see that a lot of these neurons aren't even connected with anything. And that means that there are very, very few synapses present in the newborn brain. Um, the most developed parts of the newborn brain are the motor cortex. Um, so the baby does have some limited motor capability. Um, and also the auditory cortex. So the newborn baby can hear pretty well. In fact, a fetus can hear. Fetus can recognize, a newborn baby can recognize a story that it heard in utero. So the, the, the um, phase of synaptogenesis is actually the most advanced in um, 
motor cortex and auditory cortex. Other cortices are relatively immature when the baby is born, which is why baby has very poor vision, um, and even motor control really isn't very good. Their motor um, capacities are very, very limited. But as these synapses form, as the dendrites begin to elaborate like branches on trees and they come in contact with each other and form synapses, the circuitry obviously is becoming more and more complex. Everywhere these cells are connecting with each other, they're forming a synapse. And so the complexity, just the mathematical complexity of the circuitry is exponentially greater at two years old than what it is in the newborn. And so the axon uses these protein structures to move outward, and what it's looking for is attractive protein um, molecules that are in the, in the um, extracellular fluid towards which it's going to move, and also repulsive protein signals which it's going to uh, move away from. And the, um, these are basically morphogens, protein signals that are created by transcription of, of genetic cues. And the relative distribution of these attractive and repulsive cues are going to set up the initial location of the axons and where they're going to form their synapses. So through this pushing and pulling and through different gradients um, or mapping of these different cues, um, basically the transcription of these morphogens is setting a blueprint or a map for how the axons need to move to the correct place to form the correct synapse with the correct neuron. And so this is the primitive beginnings of the form formation of um, specified neurocircuitry. Um, a lot of this is going to be continue to be influenced postnatally. Um, some continues on through experience, but initially, what we're going to see is a massive overproliferation of these um, synapt um, synaptic formations. So, axons are going to form connections with every all kinds of neurons, um, and later in postnatal development, around um, one to two, three years of age actually all the way up to young adulthood, those connections will gradually be pruned away. So most of this um, axon pathfinding and synaptic formation is occurring very early on. And what's happening subsequently is that the unneeded ones are being pruned away, not so much so that new ones are being added. And all of that is happening through these um, guidance molecules. And again, this activity is being modulated by the microtubules um, and these filaments, which give structure to, so otherwise these um, neurons would be sort of blobby. They're fluid, they're little fluid-filled packages. Um, they don't really have a skeleton like we have. So these protein microtubules and filaments provide an internal sort of skeleton that gives uh, the neuron a structure and allows it to therefore move outward. Um, and I mentioned the process of pruning, and here we're seeing a graph of that process because we're seeing the number, the total number of synapses per cubic micrometer of cortex, and we see that the number of synapses, it's very low before birth because no synapses can be formed really until neurons have completed their migration. They're not going to form synapses until they're in their final spot because to do so while they're moving would be like holding hands through the open window of a car that's driving on the highway, and it makes very very little sense. And so they wait until they get to their final location. They send out their axons and their dendritic arbor, and they begin to form uh, an overabundance of synapses. So the peak in the visual cortex happens just a little bit before one year of age. The auditory cortex, we see an initial peaking here, and again I said that this auditory cortex comes online very early, but we also see um, another peak later on which could have to do with um, language development. Um, and again we see a lot of the pruning or the elimination of synapses happening subsequently in later postnatal life. So from one to ten years, a lot of pruning is going on in the primary sensory cortices. Um, in the fr um, frontal cortex, this pruning process goes on up until the early 20s. And there are factors that influence um, pruning itself, primarily um, the idea that was uh, developed by Hebb um, that basically networks that are going to be activated are going to be maintained. So, so neurons that are firing and sending signals to other um, neurons through active synapses are going to be maintained and they may even be elaborated through the formation of additional synapses. Whereas neurons that are um, uh, 
neurons that are basically not activated, and here what we're seeing is a um, neural circuitry um, diagram from the from the experiment that Hubel and Wiesel did where they patched a kitten's eye, and they found that all of the neural connectivity that corresponded to that patched eye was eliminated or pruned away, and in fact some of the neurons themselves actually ate, went through apoptosis and, and um, disappeared. Whereas the connectivity supporting um, the left eye or processing information from the left eye was strengthened. So these synapses were elaborated while these were pruned away. Um, and this kind of a principle underlies um, children's ability to learn a musical instrument, to learn um, foreign language, the explosion in vocabulary that children have. So adults can form new synapses and we can learn new things, but it's nothing compared to what children can do because they have this over-proliferated um, synaptic foundation from which they can pick the synapses that they want to use um, and prune away the rest, whereas adults have to actually actively form new synapses in order to learn new things and or modify existing synapses, strengthen, strengthen synapses. Um, I don't know that we'll really get into that in this class, but if any of you have, have had a bio or physio class and talked about um, long-term potentiation, it means that the power of synapses can actually change, their thresholds can change, and that's another form of that underlies learning in adults. But uh, synaptogenesis um, in children is a major form of um, that underlies learning and the acquisition of skills. Uh, this is a diagram from the Nowakowski paper, and what he's basically talking about here is the initial um, exuberant projection system and then subsequent pruning away. And this patterning um, doesn't just drive the total number of synapses, but it, but it also drives the sculpting or the form formation of specific um, con connective pathways. And so, for example, if we assume that S is the thalamus, and that subdivisions of S are different thalamic nuclei, and that T is the cortex. And let's say T are different regions of cortex. Let's say um, S1 is visual, S2 is auditory, and S3 is somatosensory thalamic nuclei, and that um, T1, T2, and 3 are visual, auditory, and somatosensory cortex. We can envision the, pa the initial patterns of exuberant connectivity in several different ways. One is that a given um, thalamic nucleus may initially project to all the different um, uh, cortical uh, um, regions, but ultimately some of the pathways are pruned away so that this structure now specifically projects to one um, cortical uh, lobe. Alternately, we can have lots of different thalamic nuclei all projecting to one region of cerebral cortex, and th these projections are pruned away so that this particular part of, or this particular thalamic nuclei now projects to this particular cerebral cortical area. And the most likely outcome is that we have a combination of both. And so probably what we see in the neonate in terms of thalamocortical projections is this initial exuberant connectivity where um, visual, auditory, and somatosensory thalamic nuclei are projecting to all the different um, um, cortical cortices in different modalities. So this is called cross-modal connectivity, and this cross-modal connectivity is likely very, very strong in the baby. Um, and it, this may be retained in some adults who experience synesthesia, which is a combining of the different sensory um, processing systems. And so there's some theories that a failure to prune away some of this multimodal um, connection is what underlies um, synesthesia in adults. But ultimately, what we're going to see in the adult is a more sculpted pattern of connectivity where the LGN, or the visual thalamic nucleus, pri primarily is going to project to visual cortex. And the um, MGN, or the auditory um, thalamic nucleus, is going to project primarily to auditory cortex. And the somatosensory thalamic nucleus is going to project primarily to somatosensory cortex. And these other cross-modal pathways are largely going to be pruned away uh, because they're not really needed. Um, now, when we talk about deprivation and the fact that uh, input for one of these pathways may be missing, for example, in congenital blindness, there may be no input being provided from the thalamic visual nucleus to the um, visual cortex. And therefore, in the um, condition of congenital blindness, we may have a retention of auditory to visual cortex and somatosensory to visual cortex pathways. And this could explain why in the adult um, congenitally blind 
blind individual with neuroimaging, we might be able to get activation of visual cortex with auditory or somatosensory input. But that is not the pattern of activity that we see in the typical, um, in the typical adult brain, where we have this very specified pattern of connectivity. Um, so this is just a timetable showing you when, roughly when these different processes occur with regards to birth. So in the human, this is postnatal development with 40 weeks being um, uh, full, full term uh, gestation and birth, postnatal development up to three years, and then onward towards young adulthood. So we see most of um, uh, neuronal and also glial proliferation is happening prenatally. Actually, glial proliferation is still happening right around here, and this is one reason why we can see a lot of white matter damage in babies born very prematurely. It's because those glial cells are, are um, subdividing actively at the time that they're born, and so any kind of an insult to their brain through hemorrhaging or hypoxia um, is going to damage those baby glia. And so cerebral palsy and other kinds of motor problems um, and other kinds of white matter injuries are common in babies born during this phase of prenatal development where the glia are, are still proliferating. So we have neuronal birth early on and then glial birth slightly later. The neurons and the glia are then going to migrate to their final locations in cortex. Most neuronal migration is completed also prenatally, glial migration still um, continuing through postnatal. Um, axons and dendrites are going to extend and um, develop their outgrowth. This can't happen until they've reached their final migratory phase, so this, this phase has to be after migration. We're going to see some apoptosis subsequently, programmed cell death, apoptosis of neurons that aren't being activated, aren't being needed. Um, synaptic production, some begins prenatally. The baby can do some things at birth. Um, they can open their eyes and see, they can hear, they have a few limited motor movements. So we know that there are some synapses produced before the baby is born, but an awful lot of synaptogenesis continuing postnatally. Almost all myelination is postnatal, okay, because the glia are still re really being born prenatally during this phase of development. Uh, this is one reason why latencies in the newborn baby are very slow, because none of their axons, including in the motor system, are really myelinated. So axonal transmission times are relatively slow, and this is why reflexes in the baby um, are a little bit longer than reflexes in the adult. And um, you know, so if you shake a rattle and a baby turns its head, it will take a little bit longer for that to occur in a newborn versus an older child. And part of that has to do with the myelination. And then finally, synaptic elimination or pruning, which is an entire, largely postnatal process um, and kicking in right around um, 6 to 12 months, but continuing in full force all the way up through ages 12 or so. And this phase of pruning um, is largely corresponding to this early period of sensitivity for being able to learn new things, new musical instruments, new languages, because of this active pruning of um, proliferative or over-proliferated synapses during that early phase. And finally, this isn't really part of the readings for this week, but I just wanted to throw it in to give you some conceptual framework. Um, what this is is a diagram taken from B.J. Casey paper, and it's basically mapping these different processes onto what children can do cognitively and physically. Um, and so all of this, this cell proliferation and migration is happening prenatally, and then at birth we see initially from birth to three months, six months, what's coming online is our basic primary sensory and motory systems, uh, motor systems, primarily auditory first and then motor. And here the child is just learning to focus, to follow with a gaze, to hold objects. Um, so these are just the very basic sensory motor skills that come online at the same time that synaptogenesis and, pr and pruning are happening in these primary sensory motor cortices. When we look at um, associative parietal and temporal cortices, we see a much later um, synaptogenic um, peak and later pruning, and this corresponds with more complex um, uh, cognitive skills, including development of vocabulary, social communication, discrimination of faces. And then finally, in the frontal lobe, we see a peak in synaptic proliferation even later, with much later pruning. And this corresponds to things like um, complex higher-order executive decision-making, 
Um, and even earlier, just simple things like um, being able to inhibit responses. So children under 10 years of age have a lot of trouble with things like the Stroop task or Go No Go task where they have to inhibit um, a response or delay a response. And that is because that the underdevelopment of the frontal cortices that subserve those skills. And so it's important to understand that these physical processes that we're talking about in class map pretty directly onto the cognitive and behavioral skills that a lot of you are studying and, and focusing on in your graduate work. And so this is one reason that it's important to understand what's going on down here at this deep level, because when we see problems or abnormalities with these higher order um, behavioral cognitive um, skills, we can trace it back to things that went wrong in the, in the processes that are ongoing down here. And that's mostly what we're going to be talking about in this class, is the processes that are happening, the genetic cues that modulate them, and then what happens when the genetic cues are wrong and things go off track. Okay? Um, so I don't know how long that was, but hopefully it wasn't too long. And... Um, so you can take your time, listen to this, go back and listen to it twice. Um, I might have been speaking too quickly, and I, if I was, I apologize. But um, uh, I will see you all next Tuesday. And again, at that time, I will do a short recap of the papers, uh, the readings that were assigned for February 3rd. And then we'll have, uh, and we will initially have the quiz. And, and then after my presentation, we'll have our five student presentations. Okay, great. So I will see you then. Bye-bye.